Welcome to worship from Daleville Christian Church. We are glad that we can provide a portion of the worship in video and in audio. You, of course, would be welcome to attend worship services at Daleville Christian Church. See our website for location and time. That's dalevillechristian.org. We in the worship, have an affirmation of our faith. It changes week to week, but it's always from God's Word. Today's from Titus, the letter to Titus, the second chapter. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passion, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. reading of God's word for today is from another letter, the letter of John, the first letter of John called 1 John, in the fourth chapter, the first six verses. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. They are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. We begin by looking back over the history of the church and do so briefly. There was a time in the church's history when people could not read. And most, most church members couldn't read, and that went on for over a thousand years. Before we all learned to read, the church depended on its artists for visual communication of the Bible and its contents. Altar paintings, wood carvings, stained glass windows, in some churches, everywhere you looked, there was the Bible in pictures. Even the ceiling, like the Sistine Chapel in Italy. And since the Bible was in pictures, in those pictures, in those depictions, there had to be an image of the devil or Satan. If I ask each of you to show me a picture of evil or describe Satan, I'm sure that we would get many different images. Some of you might think of someone from history like Adolf Hitler, or more recently, some of you might picture Osama bin Laden as the very picture of evil. Adolf Hitler's propaganda machine always attempted to depict Jewish people as evil. 
and many Germans fell in with the National Socialist Party line. National Socialist Party, shortened to Nazi Party, or simply Nazis. So in the past, a picture was the only way to depict the evil in the Bible. A person, a face, Satan, the devil. In a commentary book I used in seminary, <clears throat> written by G.B. Carey, he looks at the book of Revelation where we read about a vision of locusts. But not just your everyday locusts. These locusts sting like scorpions. And more importantly, we read, their faces resemble human faces. G. B. Caird suggested that this verse intends to tell us that the face of evil is not the devil, but the face of evil wears a human face. That is, evil is not your neighbor or your crazy cousin or the Jews or terrorists or whoever is your picture of evil or whatever you have been led to believe. Rather, the evil we often experience does come through other people. Other people who look like us. Human faces. Not just one face. It's locusts, swarms of people. Our world, our modern world, has been plagued with some people who deny that the Holocaust ever happened in Europe during World War II. I'm not sure what motivates such people, but their denial provided reasons to demonstrate details about the Holocaust. For example, we have receipts and orders from the German government to chemical companies for the Zyklon gas and the gas was shipped to concentration camps, which were built by legitimate German construction companies with the orders including the size and dimensions of the crematorium. The Germans were not just killing Jewish people, they were killing Polish people, they were killing Russians, they killed disabled people, they killed disabled Germans first. They killed clergymen, both Roman Catholic and Protestant, whether you were German or not. You can now read about the people who were employed at the camps, the labor camps, the death camps, or the transient camps or internment camps where prisoners were on their way to somewhere else. But in every camp, the crimes always were perpetrated by people. Their faces resembled human faces. They had power to torment people. The verse in Revelation goes on to say, they had as king over them the angel of the abyss, whose name is Destroyer. An American author just over a hundred years ago had a name for evil that was institutionalized. He called them the superpersonal forces of evil. Super personal. That is, the evil was bigger than any individual, but the evil was perpetrated through individuals. Slavery is a super personal force of evil, and some people have tried to minimize the evil of slavery by saying, well, not everyone owned slaves in America. And although slavery appeared in the Bible, which seemed to make slavery acceptable, we could have a whole sermon on that topic alone, but simply put, American slavery was way worse than slavery in ancient times. For example, in the Roman Empire, a slave could buy his own freedom, and the former slave could further himself in the society. American slavery eventually did not allow for the freeing of the slaves, even upon the death of the owner. And slavery in America was racially based. Ancient slavery was not racially based. 
But the point I wanted to make was you didn't have to own slaves to participate in the evil of slavery. You could rent your slaves from your neighbor who owned them. You might not even have to own slaves. You might just have to captain the ships that brought them to America. You know the story of John Newton, who wrote the hymn, Amazing Grace. He wrote the words. He was a slave ship captain and learned that even he could be forgiven his sins through Jesus. In America, you could have just been a buyer and seller of slaves, never owning them yourself, to participate in the evil of slavery. Just responsible for the sale. Or you were a newspaper editor who accepted money to advertise for runaway slaves and maybe a bounty to catch the slaves. But the larger point is this. You don't have to be directly involved in the evil to be a part of an evil system. Even our own laws allow for such a distinction. You can be charged as an accessory to robbery or murder even if you didn't rob anyone yourself or kill anyone yourself, but you helped the person who did the crime. Aiding and abetting a criminal makes you a criminal. Evil also works like that. Evil wears a human face. The tough question is, what can be done if evil wants your face to participate? Well, that is a million dollar question, isn't it? Who wants to be a millionaire? There were any number of ways during World War II to fight the evil. The Casper Ten Boom family decided they could fight evil by working to save Jewish people from the authorities. For two years, the family were successful in getting 800 Jewish people to safety. But the work to fight evil eventually cost several of the Ten Boom family their lives. A number of people who wanted to resist the evil Nazi takeovers of their countries and other occupied territories joined their underground forces. And it would be difficult for me to even suggest that that was not a right decision. In America, Young men and women joined the armed forces to fight evil. Some Americans helped make the armaments or outfitted the equipment that would help defeat the German Nazi state. Now, you didn't have to be a Christian to fight evil in World War II, but there are any number of those Christians during World War II who, who were motivated because of their Christian faith, like the Ten Boom family. That's what kept them going to risk their lives for other people when the Ten Booms themselves would have been safe from persecution. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. We have to talk about Jesus first. Hear this quotation. When our days become dreary with low, hovering clouds of despair, and when our nights become darker than a thousand midnights, let us remember there is a creative force in this universe working to pull down the gigantic mountains of evil, a power that is able to make a way out of no way and transform dark yesterdays into bright tomorrows. I would remind you that Jesus said, John 5, 17, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. It can also be said that my father is loving to this very day, and I too am loving. But the quote that I gave to you was from Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr. In leading the fight for equality in this country 60 years ago, Reverend King knew quite a bit about gigantic mountains of evil. But Reverend King testified that even gigantic mountains of evil would give way. Those mountains could be moved. 
through faith in Jesus. The late great John McCain, to me an American hero, who served our country and survived torture in a prisoner of war camp. He wrote the foreword of a book of another hero entitled, that book entitled, The Devil at My Heels by Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini, you may know his story, was an Olympic champion who later served in the Air Force in World War II. He was lost at sea only to be recovered by the Japanese who tortured him for two years. John McCain states that Zamperini learned the same lesson that John McCain learned, that faith in yourself isn't enough to survive. Zamperini says you have to have faith in God. Zamperini confessed Jesus Christ as Lord at a Billy Graham evangelistic meeting, but Zamperini prayed while he was lost at sea. John McCain wrote, Faith in yourself isn't enough when faced with organized inhumanity on a greater scale than you have imagined possible. Faith in yourself alone is no match for the cruelty that humans can devise who have no qualms about anything. John McCain wrote further that Zamperini's life holds lessons for all of us, even those of us who live in comfort and with plenty in a time of relative peace. Remember what I told you about the exorcist, Father Lampert? Father Lampert says that he is not special, that Jesus does it all. Father Lambert doesn't need to have faith in his abilities. Father Lambert only has to have faith in the power of Jesus Christ. It doesn't mean that Father Lambert sits back and lets Jesus do all the work. Father Lambert has to face the demons. Louis Zamperini faced the demons that followed him home from the POW camp, tortures. Louis Zamperini lived to be 97 years of age. His faith in Jesus allowed Zamperini to forgive the prison guards. And he did it by going to Japan to forgive them in person. When Zamperini was in Japan after the war, most of the guards were in prison themselves for the war crimes they committed against humanity during the war. Zamperini states that we can't afford to get discouraged. He survived being lost at sea and survived POW camp. Martin Luther King Jr. knew what it was to have clouds of despair over you and mountains of evil in front of you. <coughs> Excuse me. But Reverend King stated, as Jesus said, he is greater than he who is in the world, from our Bible reading. 1 John 4, 4. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And the one who is in the world is the king of the abyss, the devil, so Jesus can help you fight evil when the evil is seen in the super personal forces of evil. But Jesus helps us in the person-to-person -person confrontations with evil. I told you before, I was a busboy at a high-end restaurant one summer. I received a portion of the tip the waitresses received. I knew I was not getting my correct cut of the tips, <clears throat> so I asked my pastor at the time what I should do. He told me I should pray. I did. Before two weeks went by, every one of those waitresses was fired. I hadn't said a word about my situation to anyone but the pastor. 
But the waitress's attitude to feather their own nests at my expense showed up in other areas of their behavior at work. I saw that. While I was busy vacuuming the dining room for the evening dinner meals one night, the owner came out to me and said, You are all alone. I had no idea what he was talking about. When I put the vacuum cleaner away, I noticed that everyone was gone but the bartender. He said the owner had fired all the waitresses. That was not what I prayed, but my problem was solved. Dr. Robert Jeffries was a resource for Bible study we had a few years ago. He has written a book entitled 10 Strategies for Surviving in a Hostile World. Pastor Jeffries writes, what is true in survival training is equally true of followers of Jesus in an increasingly secular world. And remember the book I quoted to you last week? The Survivor's Club. What is true in survival training, Dr. Robert Jeffrey says, is equally true of followers of Jesus in an increasingly secular world. We won't try to cover all those today, but we can leave with this one very important one. Remember your training and trust it. Church has trained you, my friend. If you have not learned to seek the Lord pray, and read your Bible when there is real trouble, then you have just not been listening. What did Jesus do when confronted by Satan, especially when Satan quoted Scripture to Jesus? Jesus quoted Scripture right back. To the suggestion made by Satan to Jesus that Jesus bow down to Satan. And why would Satan suggest that? Why would that be a temptation? Well, it would ruin God's plan, but Satan promised Jesus the whole world would follow Jesus if Jesus would worship him. Well, wasn't Jesus going to try and get more followers? Yes, but Jesus quoted the first commandment back to Satan, Love the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Him only shall you serve. I remind you what Professor Garrett states in her book about this cosmic battle between Jesus and Satan. We looked at Jesus' instructions to the disciples going on mission. We also read about their return in Luke chapter 10. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Jesus replied, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Snakes and scorpions. There are those scorpions again. And the serpent. Jesus said, I have given you authority to overcome all the power of the enemy. The church in Luke's book of Acts, the church is always shown winning over Satan's meddling and mischief to interfere with the mission of God in Christ. What did Father Lampert say? You have no need to fear the devil. Faithful Christians need not live in fear of the devil. Why? Because you have more power in your corner from Christ our Savior. Father Lampert wrote in his book, page 102, It's my hope that what I have shared in these pages will not increase one's fear of Satan, but rather help people come to a deeper understanding of the saving power of Jesus Christ, who came to defeat the devil. A lived and authentic relationship with Jesus will always keep the devil at bay. In an interview, Father Lampert said plainly, if you are praying, Satan is already running away from you. 
even if you and I have to deal with the super personal forces of evil. There is a way to love the Lord, and Him only we serve. Next week, we will look at more personal problems of temptation. Until then, Jesus said, John chapter 14, But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not be afraid. Amen.